be with you. And also with you. Good morning. It's good to see everyone. Happy Easter. He is risen. Uh, we have a couple of announcements. Uh, the Happiness Circle meets tomorrow, and the trustees will meet tomorrow night at 6. Does anybody have any other announcements? Uh, it's sure good to see y'all again. Uh, I remember some of your faces, uh, even, <laughs> even above the mask. Uh, next week uh, will be the announcement who the new preacher will be. And I know y'all are anxious about that. Um, years ago, in the early 1800s, the bishop sent a young circuit rider to start a church in this town that was kind of infamous for its brawling and murders and, and the way they treated people. And the preacher went, he was kind of nervous, and the first Sunday he got up and he looked out at two dozen mean-looking folks, and his Bible was shaking, and he made it through the sermon and afterwards one of the meanest, scariest looking fellows in the congregation came up to him and said, Son, don't worry, we're not going to hurt you. But that no good rascal that sent you, we're, we're going to get him. <laughs> anyway, let us now worship God. Tonight, together in affirmation of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From hence you shall come and judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the everlasting. Amen. Thank you, receive. Our gospel lesson this morning is Mark's account of the resurrection. And this is uh, from Mark 16, verses 1 through 8. And you'll see that this ends kind of abruptly. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Very early on the first day of the week when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They've been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Amen. Are there prayer concerns that people would like to add to our list this morning? 
We remember Marion Davis, Sandra Evans, Melissa Henson, Tim Jones, Lurleen Elliott, Brenda Kirtley, Jackie Dodson, Genevieve Murphy, Olivia Anderson, Riley Hale, Norma Powell, and Pat Anderson. Are there others? And then our service members and first responders, Isaac Dorney, Chris Tucker, Jesse Owens, Anthony Dory, Daniel Westmoreland, Jason Cruz, Jerry Lovell, Jeff Lovell, Nick McCoyne, Matt McCoyne, Blaine Click, Tommy Henley, Jalen McCumber, Bradford Norton, Michaela Pierpoint, and Matthew Hill. And our healthcare workers, Cassandra Waters, Jessica Woody, Kendall Hill Urbana, Sarah Fitzgerald, Shelley Woody, Kimberly Nace, Jennifer Leland, Jessica Bitwork, Lisa Donaldson, Mary Sneed, Tyler Sneed, Chelsea Leonard, Scott Waters, and Lynn Turner. Let's bow our heads. Mighty God, we gather this morning amazed at the risen Jesus, our Lord. We are gathered by the good news and we celebrate the resurrection with our singing, with our prayers, with our words. Lord, if Jesus had just died on the cross for us, we would remember him. We would tell his story and we would share his sayings. But death was conquered by life. And hatred for him was conquered by love for all. And we gather this morning in the presence of the empty tomb to celebrate that our Lord is risen and he is risen indeed. And we gather to witness and to celebrate. And we pray your continued blessings to be with the church as we live that love and share that story. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would forgive us of our sins and give us loving grace to forgive others. We pray that you would be with our world and bless us with your peace and with your healing. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Christ, who came and who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is number 322. Up from the grave he arose. We will sing the first and the third verses.
that you remember the church with your tithes and offerings. Let us offer a prayer for that now. Almighty God, we are a blessed people. And we gather in the midst of that blessing this morning. And we bring these gifts to you as an act of love and thanksgiving. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our New Testament reading is from Acts 10, verses 34 through 43. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but every in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced. How God appointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are all witnesses to what he did both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Amen. Let us pray. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. In the Italian Alps, there is a, uh, an outdoor crucifix. I may have told this story before. And to get to this crucifix, you pass the stations of the cross, uh, commemorating what Jesus did along the way to the cross. And one tourist noticed that there is a little trail that leads beyond the cross, and he made his way over to the trail and through it, through a very rough thicket. And he was surprised to find another shrine, one that symbolized the empty tomb. It was neglected with brush grown up all around it. Some folks only go so as far as the cross and fail to celebrate the joy and the victory and the life of the empty tomb. That's what we're here today to do. This is the first recorded sermon to a Gentile audience that we have. It was prompted by Peter's visit to Cornelius. This is also, I think, the last sermon preached by Peter in Acts. But he preached it to Cornelius and his household, a Roman centurion. You remember the story? Cornelius was a God-fearer. God fearer was somebody who respected God, loved God, had not made the commitment to join Judaism, but prayed a lot and did a lot of good deeds. And he had a vision. And in this vision, he was told that Peter was coming to see him. In the meantime, Peter, while lunch was getting ready, he went upstairs up on the roof to pray. And in this prayer time, he had this vision that there was a large sheep let down with all kinds of animals on it. And the voice said, Arise and eat. Peter said, uh -uh, Lord, there's stuff there I'm not supposed to eat. It says so in the Old Testament law. We're not supposed to do that. Three times the Lord had to tell him before he got the message. And sometime soon reread this Acts 10 and 11. This is, this is a mountain peak event in Acts. It is probably second only to the Pentecost story in its importance. So Peter goes to Cornelius and he preaches this sermon and at its core it's the apostolic witness to the resurrection and it's in verses 39 through 41. 
We are witnesses to all that he did both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. This outline is, is courtesy of Warren Carter. This passage talks about God, and it says something about Jesus. It says something about the church and how the resurrection impacted them. But first, these words from Phillips Brooks, the great preacher and, and author who wrote A Little Town of Bethlehem. Well, he wrote an Easter carol, and in it is this. Tomb thou shalt not hold him longer. Death is strong, but life is stronger. Stronger than the dark, the light. Stronger than the wrong, the right. Faith and hope for triumphant say, Christ will rise on Easter day. And we have to say something about Peter here because this passage talks about what happened and how the resurrection impacted Peter as well. This passage tells us and shows us what a change has occurred in the life of Peter, who had denied knowing Jesus, and, and the Gospels goes around, goes off and weeps because of this. It's hard to imagine how far he's come, and what he does here is, is just baffling. It's what psychology would call cognitive dissonance. He has a vision telling him to do something that's completely contrary to who he is and what he believes and how he was raised and what he was taught. None of those make any sense by this vision he saw. Eat of these, these things that were forbidden to eat. And then go to, to Cornelius, a Gentile. And after his vision, those sent by Cornelius are there and he invites them in to eat with him a Jew. And Jews and Gentiles didn't eat together. But Peter did. That's the difference between the vision on the roof and lunch that day. Peter's on risky terrain. Such ideas had not been expressed or done before. And he would be caught on the carpet. And you read in Chapter 11 of Acts, how the leaders in Jerusalem called him in and said, what are you doing eating with Gentiles? And so he told them the story. And they accepted it and celebrated it. Peter's come a long way. And we see the effect the resurrection had on him. The resurrection says something about God. It has unleashed divine mercy. Forgiveness for all a welcoming all into the family of the beloved by God. This is called the Gentile Pentecost, the opening up the church to many others so that all might be blessed. Faber said, for the love of God is broader than the measure of men's minds. And the question is posed, when will we, the church, catch up with the all-encompassing and partial love of God? It's a good question. When will we? Can we? Step by step, the church moves out. And Peter's visit to Cornelius is this huge leap. But are we still moving out? Sometimes the church moves forward and takes a step back. I read recently a, a letter to a church member somewhere else and it was basically saying clean up your act or get out of the church we don't want you a part of us our church controversies seem to be more about exclusion than inclusion more about who is not fit for God to love than expanding the boundaries and letting people know that he loves everybody it was not easy for him Peter said, I perceive that God shows no partiality. He had to be told three times. Three seems, three seems to be special for Peter. Three times he denied knowing the Lord. Three times Jesus said to him on that fishing trip, 
do you love me? And three times here, he's told what to do. I perceive, finally understood, that God shows no partiality. Really. Does that mean that God loves the worst sinner in the world as much as me and you? Because that's what it says here. It shows no partiality. And that's radical. Linda and I uh, visited this little girl, two and a half, I think, Brandy. She'd been beaten, died a few days later from the beating. And, and when we stood by the bedside of that little girl and prayed for her, it occurred to me, didn't like it, but it occurred to me that God loved that man that did that as much as he loved that little girl. That's radical. God shows no partiality. He loves us all. And this resurrection is trying to unleash that love to share with the world. That's what happens when life defeats death. When love defeats hate. It means a forgiving love for all by an ever-loving God who possesses this steadfast love that will not let us go. That's who God is. That's the story of the resurrection and what it says about Him. It says something about Jesus. All sins are forgiven. The price is paid. Peter's sermon is the only biography in Acts. It's the most comprehensive review of Jesus' career anywhere in Acts. Read through Acts this week and see if you can find any other things about Jesus to this extent. It talks about what he has done. It talks about telling the story. But this is a review of Jesus' life and his ministry that we have. About his resurrection, it says three things. It says it was an act of, by God for a dead Jesus. It says it occurred on the third day, not after three days, three full days, but on the third day. And it says that Jesus appeared and ate with his chosen witnesses. Now this eating with is important. You see in John, Jesus ate with the disciples and then he met them on the shore and ate breakfast with them. Because some in the early church were saying he didn't really arise. This is just a ghost that they were seeing. And so they emphasized this eating. And so we catch a vision of the, the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And if Jesus is alive and is Lord and he's in the world today, then he lives free of any kind of constraint or limits that we might set to his work of salvation. The church must catch up to this activity and to his love. And the passage reminds us what the resurrection says about the church. First and foremost, we're not just caretakers of a building, nor guards over orthodoxy or policy. No, verses 41 and 43 says we are witnesses. We tell who Jesus is and we tell what God has done. In him, and we show it, we share it. Phillips Brooks also said the great Easter truth is not that we're to live newly after death, that's not the great thing, but that we are to be here and now by the power of the resurrection, not so much that we're to live forever, as that we are to and may live nobly because we're lived forever. It changes who we are right now, not just after death. This account is a double whammy. Two lives are forever changed. Peter's and Cornelius. And oh, by the way, also Cornelius' household. And oh, by the way, the early church and you and me. Because if Peter hadn't preached that sermon, if Peter hadn't been convinced that God's love was for all people, I believe we're all Gentiles here. Would we have heard the story and the message? For many years I felt that we do not do the resurrection justice. 
We put up crosses. We wear crosses. But how do we commemorate the empty tomb and the power of the resurrection? How do we symbolize what the resurrection means in our lives? We don't wear little empty tombs or have pictures of them very often. And Thursday it came to me, maybe about 40 years too late, but Thursday it came to me. It's you and me. We're the symbol of the resurrection. We the church. That's what we're called to do. Not the building, but the church. Let loose in the world to tell the story of the forgiving love of Jesus Christ for all people. That's the power of the resurrection. That's what we're to be about. In the trial of Jesus by John Macefield, Longinus, who is a, the centurion in charge of the crucifixion, reports back to Pilate. And Pilate's wife, Procura, summons him to give an account. And she said, do you think he's dead? And the centurion says, no, lady, I don't. Well, then where is he? And he says, let loose in the world, lady, where neither Roman nor Jew can stop his truth. May we seek this risen Lord and live in his love. Amen. If you turn to page 12 and hear these words of invitation to communion. And when you come and partake, we will set the elements out for you. We have the tongs for the bread. Uh, if you want, there are some sealed communion elements here that you can take and open yourself. If you want to take some for family or friends, you can take those as well. Hear this word of invitation on page 12. Christ our Lord invites to this table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful Lord, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. and We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Lord to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, hey, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup and gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. Poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. 
through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is given for us. Blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is shed for us. Let's pray. Mighty God, we come to this your table with great love, with great thanksgiving come in great expectation. For we know that you meet us here. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
closing hymn for the morning is going to be number 364 in your hymnals. Because he lives, we will sing the first and last verses.
grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and fellowship and communion in the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs> Thank you.